In life, we are on a constant pursuit for our slice of the pie. The pie comes in many forms, whether it's starting a business, higher education, pursuing a career, raising a family, and the list continues. The burdens we face during our pursuit is lessened when we are financially fit. The Breadwinners created a platform where we can discuss finances and entrepreneurship in a judgment-free space. We're striving to encourage healthy financial discussions amongst our peers to capture our slice until we no longer want to slice and rather bake our own cake. Welcome back. Mm -hmm. Good it, to be back. It's certainly a pleasure to have you back and to discuss this regarding money and relationships. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, pretty, it's, it's pretty sensitive mm -hmm. um, for, for everyone. And I don't know the right or wrong way. I don't know if, if there is a right or wrong way to pursue it. But before we get into that, for those mm -hmm. that don't know who you are, can you let us know? Yeah, my name is Billy Gilliam. I am a licensed professional counselor and independent chemical dependency counselor. I work with couples, with individuals from a variety of um, issues with uh, their mental health, their mental wellness, or mental distress, however people like to uh, phrase it. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Now we got that very important detail out of the way. <laughs> let's talk about money and relationships. Okay. Man, okay. So let, let's start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, habits, behaviors, when it comes to not just money, but to, to everything else. Where, did that, where does it start? Does it start at home with like your parents and, or the people that are raising you? I definitely would say that, but I tend to start with rules. Couples have rules that are spoken and unspoken. They have rules that they say, that they talk about, but they also have a, a way of navigating, a way that they've created where they have these unspoken rules. So I always like to ask them what their spoken rules are and then have them evaluate, ask a series of questions to figure out what are their unspoken rules are, right? So very rarely will I hear someone say that, okay, we have a rule that if I go shopping, I tell you that I bought this, right? That's usually an unspoken rule that um, I'm, I, I just bring it home and I don't say anything about it, right? <laughs> so that's usually the unspoken rule. So couples have to first understand what their unspoken rules are. And then I tend to go back into, tell me about your upbringing, who were you? Tell me about your models for relationships, right? Mm -hmm. And people think when I say model, they think I mean good model. I don't, I mean any model, whether it's good, bad, indifferent, whether it's on television, because that can be a model as well, or in person or with aunts or with um, more nuclear family. So I, I go back to those, uh, to those particular models as well. Makes sense. So you brought up television. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm a 90s kid. Well, technically, we were supposed to be 80s babies, but I'm not sure what that really means. <laughs> but I grew up uh, early 90s. So for me, TJ Friday, I mean, we had uh, Fresh Prince actually showed on them aired on a Monday, but we had Family Matters. We had mm -hmm. uh, now I'm just drawing a blank. We had Boy Meets World. We had we had everything. And mm -hmm. the motto was to show the mom and dad. Yes. In the home. So yes. So from from a, a behavior perspective, your parents, are they, how much of an influence are they for you growing up? With? Oh, wow. They are a huge influence. They are, oh my goodness, the, the ingrained messaging is so powerful. Whether your parent was present or absent, you still get messaging. Um, but it's such a strong messaging. We do not give it the credit that we need to give it. I mean, it's an obscene amount of messaging. And it's not just the basic stuff that people think. It's the, it's the behaviors that we watch. It's the behaviors that we, uh, uh, that we have absorbed. And they, they may not even be directly towards us. They could be towards someone else and even our community that we're brought around because um, uh, messages can be incubated. Right. So mm -hmm. it's not just how we think, um, how that family member thinks in that family unit is how they are outside of that. So we pay attention to all of that and we learn how to navigate the world based on those experiences. Good, bad and indifferent. Good, bad. <laughs> yes. And indifferent. Yeah, it, it's so it's so important, but I think it's it's overlooked. And my wife and I, we over we didn't focus in on that in our early stages of our marriage mm -hmm. or our relationship but our relationship was a little different because we got together when we were like in junior our junior year of high school so oh yeah yeah that that was a little different but let's say early 20s mm -hmm. you know we're dating we're having a good time I like you you like me 
there's something here. At what point right. should we start talking about finances? Oh my goodness. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting the things that we keep private that really shouldn't be private. You really want to understand kind of the messaging that a uh, that your that your potential partner has, you know, regarding money. You know, what mm. do they think about it? What do they think about because those were arguments are going to ensue. That's what tends to break people up. Is there is their mindsets about particular things that we don't talk about. I do think it's important that we talk early. Now, do I think people can grow? Do I have different expectations of 20 year olds than I do of 40 and 50 year olds? Absolutely, very different expectations. Um, but the, because uh, in your early 20s, you're still trying to f separate, go into a process of differentiation where you're separating yourself from your family unit, but you don't really realize you are still heavily impacted by your family unit. Mm -hmm. You know, so like these, this duality of experience is happening, right? Where you're figuring out who you are as a young adult um, and you are still duplicating a lot of the ideology without you realizing that you're doing it, you know, that come from your upbringing. So I would say really people should do it as early as possible so we can start, stop stigmatizing um, these particular topics when it comes to money or any topics for that matter. I don't think there's a... Uh, you know, not, not, I don't, do I think you should come to a first date with your credit report? Probably not. You know, I think that's a little extreme. That's a bit much. <laughs> that's a bit much, you know. But I do think that the conversation about money and money mindset needs to be an open conversation. I certainly agree. Yes. I, I couldn't agree more, especially at this stage in life. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't agree more because beliefs. Are, yes. are different. Some people like to spend, some people like to save. And mm -hmm. In the beginning, you may be, you know, you may be caught on, you may be attracted to that guy or to that gal because they got nice things, the way they put themselves together yes. and all that. But once you start peeling those layers back, it's like, oh my God, dude, you're in that much debt. Like, why did you spend $600 on a jacket or, mm -hmm. you know, or, or things of that nature? So um, as far as stages in a relationship, let's say we're older, let's say we're in our late 30s, mm -hmm. Early 40s, we may have a couple kids there, may or may not. We have a blended family. Um, is that does that conversation happen sooner than your early 20s, or or it, it just depends on the situation? It may depend on what that person's looking for, but I do th well, at that time people tend to be a little more stable in terms of kind of who they are in family unit, who they're going to expose their kids to, or things of that nature. So I do think it's really important. But you brought up something I think that is equally important. How people approach people says to me a little bit about what they think about money, right? And so uh. I have seen where people will approach people about what they have. They have this, 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 and this. They make this, this, and this, and this. And that tells me right away, like, wow, I can see that money is a definition for you, you know? Money defines for you, you know? And showing it defines. You know? <laughs> That's a big one. You know? That's a big one. Showing it defines. Um, and that comes from a place of lack, from my perspective. That's a place of lack, because people who have, um, I remember when I went to school, and I went to school in Shaker, and there was such a, uh, uh, we had kids that had a lot of money, and we had kids that had barely any money, and I remember, like, um, like this one kid who drove this really old 89 Toyota, this little piece of crap or whatever, but he lived in this incredible house, you know? <laughs> I mean, it was just incredible. Um, but then also people who didn't have much at all, but they drove these incredible cars, you know. So uh, a lot of times it can come from a place of lack. And when people demonstrate that in the beginning, that should be paid attention to. But if that's something that's attractive, then you're not going to see that because it's, it's not going to look like a red flag. It's going to look like a plus sign until you get down the line. Then it'll, uh, it'll be a red flag. <laughs> <laughs> it, that's so interesting because we, we all do it. Yeah. We all do it, you know, if so-and-so drives a nice car, so-and-so dresses a certain way, or I like so-and-so because they weren't this and they weren't that, but in reality, it's like, oh man, you know, exactly what's going on in that person's life. Mm -hmm. And, but why, why are people attracted to that in the first place? Why do you think? I think um, well, attracted to, because I think it's a bit of status, insecurity, right? Mm. Um, I think people see it as something that is secure. So if you have these things, it makes you secure. It makes you secure that therefore it can make me secure and so people are attracted so I don't really think it's the money people are attracted to I think people are attracted to the perceived security of the money you know um, and it's not even a real thing 
you know, it's, a, it's an illusion of security, but it's not really security. And all, I mean, and honestly, and because we operate emotionally so much, it's close enough. <laughs> wait, wait, back up a second. How is it, how is it an illusion and not the real thing? Because if it's f all about the flash and what you have, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily, it doesn't mean necessarily that this person is stable. It doesn't mean that. It no. means they look like something. It doesn't mean they are anything, to be honest with you. They just look like they have this and look like they have that. But they can pull right up, I mean, and, and, and this is no disrespect to, to where people live, but I've seen people pull up in really disparaging places in really incredible vehicles. You know? All the time. Oh, stuff I can't, I, can't, I can't afford that, <laughs> you know? So. All, all the time. I mean, if you want to see a car show, Go Lee and Harvard on the yes. weekends. I, I went to Kennedy. So um, our parking lot was a car show after school every, mm -hmm. every, every day. It was, a car, it was a car show. So, But even present day, you go there on the weekends or at night, and you see no knock to any of my friends that live over there. I love you guys <laughs> to death. But it's, it's real. And yeah. now where I live, I see nothing but like Toyotas, Hondas, and things like that. But, um, but that doesn't mean one is good and one is bad because it's the assumption that the people that are in those other areas live there, right? And they're mm -hmm. not just, I don't know what they're doing there, but hanging out and things like that. But that, the illusion, that's so real. Mm -hmm. That's so real. So earlier you mentioned that um, people really don't address the, the money issue as they should. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So where do you rank money as far as an, a, a determining factor in divorce? Oh my goodness, money is um, what, number two? And behind and what, infidelity? Two. But yes, behind infidelity, which really isn't number one. Um, it, infidelity is a symptom of another problem. Okay. Yeah, infidelity well, isn't the issue. It, the issue is what drives people to infidelity. We spend way too much time focusing on the symptom of infidelity. The, the driver was well before that. So infidelity in my world is only a symptom of another issue. I need to find out what that issue is, you know, on both parts, you know, on either partner, it's really a symptom. And so if I can get to the understanding the, the, the virus, you know, for, yeah. for the lack of a better word, then we can figure out why the infidelity took place to begin with. But we cannot just focus on, that's why I said it is and it isn't, because it's, people have a variety of reasons on why they get there. But right. you have to know what those reasons are to fix them. It's not about him or her or the, that person not cheating. It's why did this happen? You know, kind of off subject, but mm -hmm. on subject mm -hmm. <laughs> to what we're talking about. Um, do you think that it, there's a disparity between men or women who cheats more, like in a marriage? In a, uh, who cheats more? I think the type of cheating is different. Um, there's levels to it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The type of cheating is different. Uh, and, and, you know, and this is really anecdotal, so I would say just from my experience, I think that when women engage in extramarital affairs or extra relational affairs, it's largely emotionally, emotionally oriented, you know. They are, there, there is, they will get in emotionally involved, you know. With men, I think it's a little bit different. I even think the reason why it's different, you know. Um, it may be more physical in nature. In addition, I was watching this one video yesterday that I thought was so interesting, is that his marriage had ended and um, he had a mistress as well. And the mistress, the relationship ended as well because it wasn't just the idea that he wanted her. What he, what he liked was the secrecy, you know? And what, mm. what does that mean he wants secrets? No, that means he wants novelty and his marriage didn't have it, you know? sounds like a book <laughs> that that but that still doesn't justify exactly but explanations don't justify they just provide the explanation finding the why yes finding the why yes. that that is so that's so important mm -hmm. um so in this business i got my start doing credit repair mm -hmm. and i started my i was my very first client back in 2010 so i've been doing it man for a little over a decade and it wasn't until a few years ago that I realized that I was only treating a symptom because mm -hmm. your credit score is just a reflection of your relationship with money. That's all it is. Right. So right, right. I can fix your credit, but if you don't fix your relationship with money and your behaviors, it's going to go back to the same place. Yes. So it's 
it, that's another reason why it's, it's so crazy how our professions are different, but we have a lot of similarities in which we uh, pursue our clients and get them to um, change their behavior, which yes. is super hard, which is super yes. hard. So, yes. so for us, um, money beliefs is, is real because you have people that spend, you have people that save. Mm -hmm. But naturally, if you're attracted to someone and you don't understand their beliefs in the beginning or you're kind of blind by it or you just ignore it. Right. Right. We're adults. Right. 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 So with those different behaviors, what would you suggest for them? How can you coincide or live in the same space knowing that you see things totally different? Yeah, that's good. I think people can. And I don't think people have to be the same. I think people have to value similar things. Okay. I don't think their behaviors have to be the same. So, so what, and, and each person could actually help the other, right? If the person who is the spender, and that it just is an issue of balance to me. If the spender needs the saver and the saver needs the spender, you yeah. know, in, in a way. But as long as we, there's an understanding of the balance in those rules that are spoken for them to make that what's um, covert, overt, they can actually navigate that space. They can actually be really good for each other, to be perfectly honest. Um, but they, people do need to value the same thing, you know. Um, but sometimes I have to help people under help people get there and figure out what is it that you value. And 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 you would think people would know that, they they don't. We're very stimulus response. I mean, I don't mm. mean to reduce people to just behaviorism, um, but we do live in that cycle of we're just used to doing a certain thing. You know, I'll get on Amazon and I'll say. You don't even want anything. What are you doing here? You don't want anything. You just look in here to say, what can I buy? <laughs> there's <laughs> nothing you want. And then I get off because there's nothing I really want. You right. know? I'm just looking, I was like, that's boredom. Boredom is a symptom for me to go say, oh, do I want to purchase something? And I know that for myself. You know, so I have to, I have to name it and go, you're just bored. You don't want anything. Yeah. <laughs> So, but even with couples, it's just being able to uh, have that conversation on what they value and have them speak about what their rules are. But I do think people can be different. They just have to value the same things. Makes sense. So there's this argument, right, mm -hmm. that my friends and I, we always have, um, but it, it's, it's so revealing mm -hmm. to me that, uh, so I'll start with this question, traditional roles, mm -hmm. like how our parents, grandparents were as, back in then, are, are those still relevant today? Or should we still value them today? Traditional roles. Want me to give you an example? Yes, I want you to say more. Okay, yes. here's an example. <laughs> like like the, the man's supposed to pay all the bills. Mm -hmm. And although the, the wife is no longer like at home, she's working, but the man still pays all the bills. Like something like that. Mm -hmm. And in your question, say it again, is, is that whether or not that's still relevant today? It Should it be relevant? Should it be? I, I think, again, I go back to rules. I think so. There was a, there was a video my, my daughter watched, and um, he they weren't married, but he went he was going to work, and she was staying at home, and she said, well, I'm glad I'm not you. <laughs> she was... <laughs> oh, what, it was like a bad day outside? No, something? he was going to work, and she was staying home. Oh. And they don't have any kids or anything like that. And so uh, that's crazy. Yes. <laughs> that's what my son said. And so, <laughs> and so I was laughing. I said, I said, you know what? I said, that's only a problem if they both see it as a problem. You know, other than that, it's not a problem at all. If that's the rule for themselves, you know, I don't know what the rules. Maybe he doesn't want her to work. Maybe that's not what he wants. I do think we get overly caught up in what we're defining as roles versus what we want as far as rules for ourselves and what things mean, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I think people think things are very cut and dry, black and white, that traditional means this is this. I don't really think that. So I'll hear, what I saw online today, for all those uh, women who don't need a man, like who's shoveling your driveway, <laughs> right? And I was like, wow, you know, that's so serious, you know. But that's, that's taken out of context. That's not really what she's saying. You know, um, but I think that's what's being heard is that uh, that it's not needed because women are doing X, Y, Z. And I don't think that's the real message. So I think we get caught up um, in this in our messaging. And it's I don't know what's the word. I think it's uh, it's missed. I think it's an important conversation to have. And um, I think there's value. 
-hmm. But I also think that it's really based on what people's rules are for themselves in their coupleship, so to speak. And that leads me to the to the question of uh, when does my money becomes our money? Is, is oh, that's that, a great, that's is, great. Is that at marriage? That is so good. That really needs to be early conversations because, okay. oh my gosh, that needs to be early conversations because I have seen couples fall apart when it says, well, we're married, so this is our money. And, you know, he's like, no, this is my money. Or she's like, this is my money. If you don't navigate that in the beginning of what's considered ours, mm -hmm. you know, and what's considered yours, and 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 I I might have a different mindset, but I no, I on. fully struggle when people live independently as a married couple. Like that is that's strange to me. What is that? So when people live independently, it's where it's like this is all mine, this is and this is yours. And there's no sense in my world, in in, in my thought process when it comes to marriage of oneness. You know, and if there's mm. no oneness, there's no trust, you know, and so you're going to always think I'm trying to take something from you. So I do believe that there should be a concept of this is what we are doing because we are planning a life, a unit forward, not as individuals, we're not roommates, at least that's not the idea, <laughs> you know, as roommates then yeah. Um, but I really do think it becomes an our thing. So when you are marrying someone, you are trusting this. You know, that's why the conversation has to happen. Uh, but when people live in this mind in yours, you, to me, that is the beginning of a problem. You're mm. going to see that as a problem, you know, in the future, at least from my perspective. So, yeah, that, <clears throat> that's interesting. So you can say, like, not just like separate bank accounts. We're mm -hmm. talking like completely separate everything or a, a good mix of both to where there's a clear understanding what's mine is mine is what yours is yours. But... Yeah, in the marriage, it, it is, we, we are one. Mm -hmm. So what's mine is ours, or what, what's in my marriage, what's mine is hers and what's hers is hers. I mean, it works that <laughs> way when it comes to debt, right? You know, they can, yeah. you know, the debt belongs to both people when they're married. Does it belong to one? <laughs> no, you're right about that. People. You are right about that. You know what's crazy? Um, I didn't know there was a term for this, but financial infidelity. Oh, say, what does that mean? Financial infidelity? Yeah. There's like a huge thing about it. So in our world, financial infidelity is when you make decisions, financial decisions without your partner. Oh, wow. Then yeah, I know a lot of couples. I even know of a financial abuse. So that's how I, the term I know. But yeah, oh. wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I'm thinking, really? But there's like levels to it, yeah. right? So, you know, if I go out and I buy a shirt or if I buy, you know, if I go out and buy dinner, that's not really financial fidelity. Right. But if I go out and I buy a car that's a without, yes. then it's like, yeah, we should have had this conversation. Yes. But I think with, I, and I want to get your opinion on this, from, from a man's perspective, our ego is so, you know, it, it's there and we have pride. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, checking in with like, your, checking in with your wife may not be like the most manliest thing. Maybe the word means, I, I would re- I wouldn't use the word with checking in. You know, I would probably say that this is something that we process and we talk about. Um, and that would be, to me, what that looks like. What do we talk, how do we process this? What do our check-ins look like? I actually have couples do check-ins. You know, um, once a week or once every couple of weeks, they should be checking in. And not just on tasks. They cannot be anything about tasks. Who's taking the kids? Who's doing this? Who, I don't care about that, you know, because you're going to mm -hmm. navigate that anyway. It's more about core belief stuff. You know, so that way your thoughts about the car or looking at the car will show up in this in this check in that you both get to talk about and process. Um, but I do think that is a that's a real issue in terms of uh, couples not navigating those conversations. Um, but if you are open with a person. Um, we talk about huge purchases like that. I, it made me think of something that I yeah. did very young. I bought a dog and I should have, I didn't have a conversation at all. I just wanted the dog, <laughs> you know? Right. And I tried to, uh, I tried to find a way to make that make sense. <laughs> 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 and I was dead wrong, you know? Cause mm. I knew it was going to be an issue. So I was like, I'm just going to get this dog. It's so cute. You know, everybody. <laughs> but it was wrong. You know, I should have had the conversation because it wasn't going to be just my responsibility, you know. I brought another bill in the house, so to speak, you know. Um, but, yeah, so I do think that there should be, checking in might not be the, the best word for it, but there should be a process that we both negotiate to determine where money is going to be spent. 
or like a threshold, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Threshold is even better, right? That's even better to be perfectly yeah, honest. Yeah, I think that can make things very black and white. Yes, thresholds um, make things black and white. That's definitely. True. So now we we are at this point. Let's say we are at this point in our relationship mm -hmm. where we're, we're doing things that one person don't like. She doesn't like that I do this. I don't like that she does that with money. How do you approach those uncomfortable situations and not blow them out of proportion? Mm -hmm. So I have a, um, a formula that I use when you speak about blowing out of proportion. Where is the actual event? Okay. What's the perception of the event? What's the judgment of the event, whether it's good or bad? And then what feelings that elicit, you know, and taking people through that on like, okay, so what actually happened, you know? Um, and then what's more important is not what happened. What's more important is what's your perception of what happened? That's way more important. You know, because that's what drives your feelings and behaviors. Well, she only did that because she don't care about my opinion, or he only did this because he don't respect my thoughts. You know, those things matter. Um, and those are usually off, you know. Those perceptions are usually off. So I would say definitely in terms of understanding that, that formula and saying, is your perception real? Let's talk about that. Because most of the time it's not. We can have what's called a myopic experience where we will, uh, myopic, myopia is where we avoid all the evidence around us and we only hyper-focus here, right? And, and, but there's all this other stuff that's there and we don't pay attention to that evidence. We only pay attention to the evidence that, that um, supports our argument, you know? Um, so I think even taking couples through that formula so they don't blow things out of proportion. But again, it goes right back to the conversation about rules. What are our rules regarding money? What are our standards? And, what, and if we have these standards, what are the rituals that support these standards? So w w at what point? That's not like something that needs to be established early. Yes. And perhaps, you know, when we go through like marriage counseling, should there be a financial aspect to that? Yeah, there really should, but that is not, there should be a lot of stuff that's in <laughs> premarital <laughs> counseling that's not there. It really should be there. People, I think, I think that would serve people so, that would really serve people. They can have that conversation early. But here's the part that's interesting. If you told people they're not ready, they're just going to go get married somewhere. And they're they're going to do it anyway. They're going to do it anyway. Uh, yeah. Because feelings, the feelings are strong. Especially at that the at that feelings. moment. Oh yeah, and then the you know ten years later, here comes that red flag. Somebody, it wasn't you know you done took that and navigated, made a sweater. It's been a red flag the whole time. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh. it's been there the whole time. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. So another good question is the allocation and disbursement of bills. Oh wow. Okay, so say more. I know when it comes to to money. Um, I, and I think it goes back to how you were raised, like who mm -hmm. paid the most, the lion's share of the bills in the home, who pays the mortgage, who pays the card, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but is there, is there like a standard or, or should it be a standard as to whom is, is financially responsible for what bills in the home? Okay. So I wonder if that kind of goes to, so then there's things that you can quantify that maybe are not an actual bill like or that people are responsible for. Mm -hmm. um, so if there's some kind of task or something I have like, at disdain for, then that has a monetary value for me. <laughs> there are things I will pay people for that I do not ever want to do. You know, right. if I could pay people to walk to iron, my, not to iron, to iron my clothes, I would. You know, it was like <laughs> that has a monetary value you know, for me. But um, I don't, I don't know if I believe that there's a a, a standard. I d I do agree with you that definitely it goes back to how we were raised. Mm -hmm. um, but those conversations really need to happen early because. You will not hear, I would hear couples where they were used to their mom taking care of everything because they were in a single family household. And then she had both her parents, you know, and then that, and then the father is the one that took care of everything. So she sees him as irresponsible and he can't see that. Mm. He's not irresponsible. This is the way households are. And so she has, she has given him, she's, uh, she sees him as irresponsible. He sees her as entitled. And both of them are not true. I can see that. No, I was going to say I can see that. Yeah, but, <laughs> so. but both of them, because they're really basing it off an experience that they had growing up. They're both right, and they're also both wrong, mm -hmm. based on their experience. So then they have to decide to create what the rule is for them. 
and create that new legacy for their for their kids on what money looks like and what um, what the sharing of bills look like because if we don't talk about those models then we will never know um, how we got there and why we're getting there because she's going to forever see him as like oh he's irresponsible and she's going he's going to see her as entitled and spoiled which is the words that they said <laughs> so. that makes sense I can see I can see that um, I definitely can see that mm -hmm. just because when you see the world through one lens, which is yours, yes. you're not considering all the outside factors. It's just what's there, right? And it looks like it's the, it looks so real. It looks like it's the only world that exists, you know? Um, I learned a really valuable lesson when I was, I like science, and so it was these, learning the different um, waves of light that are out here and all we see is natural light, but there are six or seven different types of light that's happening in this moment, but my eyes can only absorb this type of light. Um, it doesn't negate the fact that the rest of them exist. I just don't have access to them. Uh, but we don't live that way. We live in a way that we believe the light that we see or the way that we were up, that we were brought up is the right way. Right. <laughs> you know, we yeah. actually believe that. And a lot of our um, habits, a lot of our behaviors, it comes from, it stems from that. Mm -hmm. um, in which I'm, I'm definitely guilty of that. Mm -hmm. But it, it's so uh, refreshing to understand why yes because for us uh, for, for my profession and for yours we all we're in constant pursuit of the why right absolutely like why do we do the things that we do and how mm -hmm. can we correct that behavior so it can be more positive on mm -hmm. our on our life um, okay so best practices for let's go through the lovebirds the early stages because I think the older people they have a more sense of awareness Mm -hmm. And although they still can be, you know, messed up in the head, but they, they've been through some stuff. But the True. young people, you know, that's, you know, not just jumping a broom, but it's like moving in with each other at 20, 21, 22, mm -hmm. which they really don't know what the world is, but yes. they're just going through it. So from your perspective, what are some, some good best practices or habits to keep relationships together? Not from a financial perspective, but just together, uh, collectively. I would definitely definitely speak from the you know we we say communication um, like it's a simple thing to do like just communicate. That's tough. <laughs> it is not as simple as we think because we communicate most of the time what we think the other person wants to hear while we keep while we hold close to our vest what we really feel you know and so that's why to me counseling is so important. It provides a sometimes I. I really mostly operate as an interpreter. Like I can hear what you're trying to say without all the feelings, you know. And so that way I can give to the person, this is what he's trying to say. This is what she's saying. And then I have to give it back. So I'm, I'm usually triangulated between a couple and, and the people, people being able to speak very purely about their thoughts, not just either out of um, anger or mm -hmm. what you think the other person wants to hear you say, you know. And your nonverbals is everything, right? So people will have these nonverbal responses. And so the other person is responding to those nonverbals, you know? And so they're having like two conversations at the same time, not realizing they're having it and they're not solving it. So communication in all areas, whether it's financially, sexually, emotionally, psychologically, uh, when it comes to a parent, uh, a parenting, all those things mm. need to be real things about what do you think about this, you know? But we, we either do one or two things. We either fear losing the person or we fear losing ourselves, you know? So we never are completely honest about where we are in those spaces. I couldn't have said that better. So <laughs> well, I really couldn't have said it better. <laughs> so tell us about your book and where we can find it. Oh yeah, so my book is um, it's called The Session. It can be found on Amazon. And it's a book about the life, death, and resurrection of relationships. And I find most, it's a self-help book, but it's written through the uh, narrative. And I find most self-help books to be kind of boring, you know. I never finished one. Like, and I, you know, when I try to uh, give them to clients, they never finish them, you know. <laughs> so it was I think people are narratively driven. They learn through stories, you know, so you can gain a concept and understand something. So I wrote it from a perspective of a therapist who has her struggles, but also three uh, couples. And then I come in really as the narrator myself and unpack what the couple is going through or what the uh, clinician is trying to talk about. Um, so it could be found on Amazon and um, under, yeah, I said, under the, under the session for Billy Gilliam. 
Okay, and how can we get in contact with you to book a session? Oh, okay, so I'm at uh, parkerscounselingandconsulting.com is uh, the website. My email is parkerstherapy at uh, gmail.com, and my number is 216-339-6682. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate being here. Appreciate you, appreciate you coming on. Thanks.